This lecture is on uh, engineering applications of uh, vibrations. Uh, so far, we have studied about the basics of engineering vibration. Today, we will see in this class what are the basic engineering applications of vibration and uh, towards the sometimes in the middle of the class, we will see how vibration is used for the health monitoring of machines or condition based maintenance of machines. Okay. Some of the topics uh, which we will be discussing uh, today are essentially what happens during the case of a base excitation. For example, if you have a surface okay, and because of certain forces, there is a motion on the surface and how by putting a sensor, we can measure this motion y and sense it as a response x of the sensing element. This is the case of base motion. Usually, and typically, when we have a vibrating surface, we try to know what y is. How do you do that? We put an sensing element x, or what is it, which will be essentially housed in a transducer. So, is proportional to y, or what is the relationship between x, y as a function of the frequency, etcetera. Okay. So, once I can measure x, I know how it is related to y okay. and that is what we are going to study in base excitation. Another very important applications of or unwanted vibration is this rotational unbalance. Essentially, what we have is uh, any shaft which is supported on bearings suppose it carries a set of blades like in an uh, impeller and it this undergoes rotation imagine in this impeller if there is an unbalanced mass m or m e this unbalance was at a radius of r from the axis of rotation of the shaft you can imagine the unbalanced radial unbalance force f unbalance will be m e omega square r where omega is the speed of rotation now you see this unbalanced force because of the centrifugal action of the unbalanced mass is proportional to omega square omega is the rotational speed it's almost very small if m e is small r is small and omega is small but even if m e and r are small but omega is large like in the case of gas turbines you know rotating at 30000 rpm a small amount of unbalanced mass is going to give rise to unbalanced force and what will happen essentially is because of this unbalanced force there will be forces coming up to this bearings okay that depends this f1 and f2 depend on the position of the impeller and so on and further this will be complicated if there are sets of impellers like in a gas turbine as you will see there will be different stages of compressors so one set of compressor having you know uh, a lot of uh, veins in that uh, impeller and if one such vein has an unbalance it is going to lead to unbalanced force and this unbalanced force in different planes is going to give rise to couples and then this is going to have a complicated effect in the life of the machine. It is going to affect the bearings, bearings will be subjected to fatigue failure, there will be clearances will increase and it is going to complicate the matter. Okay. So, we should try to avoid this problem. Okay. Now, another situation we have in the engineering application is vibration isolation. wherein suppose I have a machine okay, which is put on a foundation. Because of the dynamics of the machine certain forces are being subjected to the ground and this ground is going to then vibrate and this waves will get transmitted and then 
at some other place I have another machine and they are going to affect this machine's operation. So, I have to devise a mean wherein I reduce this energy which is getting transmitted from one machine to another. This is one way of looking at it. The vice versa also happens. For example, you are driving on a road on a vehicle. and there are lot of roughness, potholes etcetera. So, these are going to give rise to forces okay. and these forces are going to get transmitted and then you are going to get a sense of vibration to the human being who is sitting in the car. And obviously, we would like to isolate this frequency which is coming from the ground, this motion which is coming from the ground by a proper selection of what is known as the vibration isolators, we will discuss about them uh, in subsequent sections. So, the vibration isolation is another serious problem in engineering vibration and then uh, we will see how we can uh, avoid it, how we can reduce it and so on. Another application of uh, vibration is this tuned dynamic absorber. What happens? Suppose, I have a body suppose, I have a body which has a mass m and stiffness k. So, omega is equal to root over k by m. Okay. This is the primary, this is its natural frequency and this is the primary mass. Now, to this system, if I if I see the response of this system, I will get a natural frequency, a response at its natural frequency which is omega which is equal to root over k by m. And say for example, this amplitude x which I have got here is something which I do not like. I would like to reduce this vibration amplitude. So, what I could do is I could attach to this system another system wherein this omega is also equal to its k s and m s. So, this system now is going to have a response which will look something like this, because there are two bodies there will be two natural frequencies and there will be a natural frequency shift and most important thing is this amplitude of vibration has reduced. So, the primary mass though the natural frequencies have shifted then, but the amplitudes of vibration has reduced and particularly this has applications in uh, for example, large skyscrapers for example, because of the wind blowing you can talk about the tall hotels in Dubai okay, or the skyscrapers of uh, New York or San Francisco etcetera. When this wind is blowing this skyscrapers have a motion I mean and this at the top could be about 1 meter imagine a 100 story building on the top it is swaying about 1 meter and this kind of motions could be arrested. Suppose, we put such structural tuned dynamic absorbers in the structure itself, so that they are going to arrest these motions and reduce the amplitude of oscillations. Uh, this is one application of tuned dynamic absorber. There are lot of applications of such tuned dynamic absorbers in uh, automobiles. For example, if you know the drive shaft or the propeller shaft, propeller shafts also undergo a lot of torsional oscillations. So, we can put such torsional tuned damping absorbers to reduce those uh, oscillations at the natural frequencies. Because uh, by tuned dynamic absorbers, we can reduce the oscillations of the primary mass because of the resonant frequency of the secondary mass. Another uh, engineering application is this torsional dampers. You recall, you know, add return this equation i t theta dot plus c t theta dot double dot sorry 
s k t theta is equal to some function forcing function torque. <coughs> so, by introducing this damping term in oscillating systems by having a torsional damper, I could reduce the oscillations of the rotational response of the system. For example, a crankshaft of an engine which is under a, which is having rotary motion and its torsional oscillations could be reduced by putting a torsional damper. So, these are uh, the some of the applications and we will see some practical examples now. To begin with, uh, if I look into uh, this case here in the case of a tractor platform isolation, here uh, we have a tractor. For example, uh, uh, of course, this is the platform where you put the foot in case this is a me in my younger days you know used to test on a tractor and this is a platform here and if the driver sits here because of the engine's dynamics okay none of the vibrations from the engine should get transmitted to the platform to the seat etc so how do they arrest that if you will cl look closer here there are actually what are known as the anti vibration rubber mounts in this location here between the platform and the chassis of the tractor so, the chassis of the tractor is actually supporting the engine. So, the forces from the engine because of the engine's excitation of the engine's um, uh, excitation forces and the inertia forces, the engine excites the structure. So, this chassis is going to have large motion and if this platform was rigidly connected to the chassis, it was it all this energy is going to get transmitted to the platform. Instead, we put a flexible element you can think of it as a structural fuse or you can think of it as an structural impedance mismatch. The energy which is if you analogous to an electrical circuit, if I put an if I have an uh, impedance mismatch in the system, the current is not going to flow or the power flow will not be maximum and same is happening here also. The mechanical power flow is reduced by having an impedance structural impedance mismatch which is created by this vibration isolator. So, depending on the payload being subjected to the isolator depending on its mass, the frequency of operations, I can decide on the natural frequency of the oscillator, I can decide on the uh, stiffness characteristics of this, uh, of this uh, isolator. This is another such view of this isolators and uh, this isolators just need not be elastomer or uh, no, polymeric, uh, polymeric mounts, they could be also spring mounts because you know this elastic mounts they wear out with time the elastomers sometimes they react with the uh, oil and they lose their property sometimes they react with the uh, saline atmosphere etc around you and then they will lose their structural stiffness and their uh, bonding strength so sometimes in many harsh applications people use uh, other uh, kind of mounts which I'll come to later on now, this is the case of a gas turbine you know wherein this turbine rotates at about 30,000 rpm and then there are series of such impellers which will be the compressor and then the turbine and this comp uh, compressor you know, there could be many such uh, uh, blades in the or veins in the impellers and uh, if one such set of compressor ring undergoes an unbalance it is going to give rise to a radial force. Suppose another one has another amount of unbalance it is going to give you a radial force. So, there could be a couple. So, in this couple this is they are going to give rise to a lot of forces though this turbine is put on a uh, structure here or a platform and this platform is rigidly mounted to the uh, hull of the ship or fixed to the wing of the aircraft. So, now this is a closer view of this compressor imagine that this all of these rotate at 30,000 rpm or 20,000 rpm. Imagine if one such vein either has a small amount of unbalanced mass you can imagine the kind of forces which are coming onto the uh, bearings which are supporting them. So, an unbalance at high speeds is very very dangerous and in fact this amount of unbalance depends on the severity of the machine. Suppose it is a very high speed machine, uh, we will have serious consequences. So, for example, you are talking about a high speed machining operation where we have a spindle 
and there is the amount of unbalanced mass on the spindle. Suppose you are doing a vertical uh, boring and if there is an unbalanced mass and because of this there are radial forces, you will never get a true bore. Okay, there will be overlay in the bore. So, all these are going to affect the performance or the uh, your output of the machine. It could be a machine surface, it could be a uh, gas turbine, it could be a um, uh, effect on the it could affect the bearings. So, these are actually the causes by which the machines fail or the reasons behind which machines fail. If one such unbalance goes unnoticed and we only get woken up when the bearings fail, but the problem could have been an unbalance usually has created this. So, it is very I mean people do that and once they install a machine, they ensure that the machine is balanced perfectly to its operating speed and in the subsequent classes I will also be telling you how to do a field balancing of a such a large gas turbine or a fan which is rotating, rotating at high speeds. Basically, you know what happens I should briefly tell you here in the radial plane. For example, if this has lot of you can call it veins, blades whatever. If there is a small amount of unbalanced mass and this is rotating and uh, in this machinery and this of course, in there in a casing etcetera okay, and I measure this response here. By some technique if I can find out this amount of unbalance and if I know the location of this unbalance physically with respect to a certain marker in this vein, I could put a correction mass okay, in a single plane and then I will have a balanced uh, rotor or a balanced disc. But if there are multiple such discs along, a sh uh, along the length of the shaft, I have to make sure that each one of them is balanced. Otherwise, if I have a balanced here, okay, if I have a balanced mass, uh, unbalanced mass here and a balanced mass here, I may be balancing it in one plane, but the couples will still be there. Uh, this is also something which we have to be careful about. Another uh, application or I should show you is this anti vibration mounts. For example, this is a setup from our lab. When you have the system running, there will be a lot of forces coming onto this uh, structure and this structure will eventually transmit to the foundation. So, these are what are known as anti vibration mount. You can see one mount here, another mount here. So, imagine if next to this machine I had a very sophisticated laser based measuring systems, okay, an optical table. Wherein uh, this is a table. Okay. And there is a laser beam being uh, produced and then it has certain target which it has to hit a strike. If there is a small amount of uh, oscillations because of certain ground vibration. So, what is going to happen that this source is also going to have a motion. So, I can never hit my target by laser beam and there are many engineering applications wherein lasers are used. Lasers are used in you know, microscopy, lasers are used in machining, lasers are used in surgery. Imagine if such laser beam, you know, if imagine a doctor coming to your eyes to do a laser, a laser surgery and his hands are shaking. Okay, and now I will bring it back here in an optical measurement table because I, ha I have a hard um, imagine you have a large uh, forging hammer in your workshop next door. Okay. Of course, you have made a nice building and then there are nice walls etcetera. So, the workshop and then you have a lab here, here being a laser lab okay. because of the forging hammer lot of forces are coming and then this forces come to the ground and then this are going to get transmitted through the ground and then they are going to affect the laser. And this is a, not a science fiction, it does happen. Uh, there has been instances in a why, where I have uh, measured vibrations of the level of micro g, you know, micro g is 10 to the power minus 6 g. Okay. In fact, wherever uh, when we have uh, laser based measurements, the vibrations have to be less than 10 to the power minus 6 g. Okay, meters per second square or whatever. 
with that low a vibration level. Okay, but question is how do I achieve it? Suppose I have a forging hammer next to it, or uh, I'll give you a more realistic picture. I, I had visited a lab where we are doing some uh, isolation selector for a laser machine, a laser measurement system, laser microscope to be precise. Uh, in this building, there was an elevator. Each time the elevator was going up and down the shaft, they were having problems in their laser based measurements. Because you know, once we have an elevator going up and down the shaft, because of the elevator's movement, the vibrations were getting transmitted from the elevator shaft through the foundation to the laser lab. Okay? And, uh, and the measured vibration levels were even 10 to the power minus 6 G. And that is small enough to create problem in a laser based measurements. Okay? So, as an engineer, as a vibration specialist, we have to decide on what is known as this isolators. Isolators both for motion and both for forces. Because you know, you, you think about earthquakes. When earthquakes occur, why do buildings fall? Because excessive forces have come through the foundation. Okay, so, we have to design and decide on uh, isolators. Vibration is the uh, motion is one. Next, you know, we will we'll talk about uh, cases when we have impulses, nuclear blasts, shock waves. Okay. What happens when we have shock waves? What happens when we have a missile firing on the deck of a ship? Okay. So, how do we arrest that the ship, uh, ship should not rock? Okay. Other uh, electronics and the, the equipment in the uh, control panel should not get affected. Because once we have such shock waves coming in, they are going to give rise to fatigue loading. Shock coming once, shock coming twice, repeated shocks they will induce fatigue load on the machine. And then the structural components, maybe the electronic solders would fail. Imagine a printed circuit board, okay, wherein we have a lot of solder <coughs> solders. And this uh, printed circuit board is kept on a platform, wherein very close to it, you are firing a missile. And there is no protection to arrest the vibration caused once you fire this missile. And this forces are going to excite the solders and solders will give away eventually okay, and then you will have a component failure. So, the reliability of the equipment has to be also ensured that they do not fail under repeated shock loading, repeated forces, repeated motions. So, this has to be also ensured. Yeah, this uh, is one another example which I was talking about and you must have seen this. When we have this uh, generator driven by an engine and because of this uh, motion of the engine, because the engine itself, because of the inertia forces and the gas forces are going to have and you must have studied in your dynamics of machines that some of these forces are not balanced. Okay, whatever we call a perfectly balanced machine, but then there are some orders at which balancing forces are there and these forces will also excite the foundation and this has to be isolated by I could have elastomer mounts, but nowadays you know people are using cable mounts. You know this cable mounts, it can flex in uh, both directions longitudinally, transversely. So, it can take up forces in any direction because if I was talking about an anti vibration mount, which you will see that the, the mount which we have is usually in one direction say. Okay. But suppose the motions are in three directions, it becomes very cumbersome to put you know, three isolators in three directions. Rather, uh, the convenient way of doing it is through cable mount or sometimes in people also known as wire rope mount. Because of the fact that there are no elastomers here. So, they can be subjected to weathered conditions in the saline atmosphere, in an oil, in oil uh, mist full uh, at atmosphere. So, they will not wear out with time and because of these are made of high strength stainless steel, they will not corrode. They can take more load for the same available space. So, cable mount is uh, people are uh, particularly in the defense, they are using a lot of cable mounts because it can survive a lot of harsh environment. This is another case of a missile launcher. Uh, and then here you see again the cable mounts have been put here. And such a system could be put on the deck of your ship. And then once you have the missiles firing, none of the motions are going to go through the deck to the other systems in the ship. Okay. 
of course, you know you will see we will be doing certain uh, numericals how to do we calculate the stiffness, how do we estimate the damping, how do we estimate the payloads uh, of the uh, mounts. Well, uh, this is uh, from a catalog of a uh, manufacturer of isolators, I will just show you some of the examples here. These are the normal helical springs which are used as mounts and some of these are actually pads where they are in, there are pockets here. For example, when you compress them, they are going to flex in and take in the load. These are the cable mounts and these are some of the conventional spring helical uh, mounts and they could be a series of such springs and then there could be uh, a damping associated with uh, damper associated with it and so on. I will now give you a typical example as to say for example, I have a machine. Okay, I will just draw the base of the machine and suppose it is put on four isolators. And then there is a, this machine has a certain mass m. Each one of them has a stiffness k. So, springs in parallel the effective stiffness is nothing k effective is nothing but summation of the k's and this will be 4 k. Okay. And the natural frequency of this system will be m by 4 k. Okay. Now, imagine the question is uh, what is the motion of this or the vibration which is transmitted to the ground because of this system. Uh, this system say for example, it is rotating at a certain speed omega, there is a rotating component which is rotating at a speed omega and which is known as the driving frequency. So, we will define a ratio r is equal to omega by omega n. So, the ratio which is transmitted or the displacement is actually given by where zeta is the damping uh, coefficient factor. Okay. And R is the frequency ratio. Now, if I plot this, what happens is if you look at the typical vibration response plot, Now, if I increase the, if the damping reduce uh, is very less, what happens is this amplitudes go up. Okay. And if I increase the damping, okay. so at, at resonance, I can always reduce the motion, vibration motion by introducing damping. Okay. Now, how is that done? Actually, we can, there are many ways to introduce damping. In rotational systems, they use what is known as torsional damper. particularly in uh, crankshafts of engine.
another is by damping, coating or sandwiched beams and they are both constrained and unconstrained. So, basically if I have a surface a sheet metal in the constrained layer damping what I could do is I will have another thin structural material and here I will put a viscoelastic elastic damping material. So, because of the relative motion of these two members there will be an hysteresis loss and then the energy will be damped, the an energy will be reduced and then the oscillations of vibration will reduce. This is one. Another is just coating with a unconstrained we just pay, coat it with a damping material which is known as the kind of a coating. Commercially a lot of damping paints are available to measure such or to put on the structures to reduce the motions at resonance. Coming back uh, to this figure here, so this is how the structure of the inner, uh, internal of a vibration isolator looks like. This is a steel base plate and here there is a neoprene uh, rubber body which acts which gives stiffness and sometimes also gives some inherent damping in it. And so, one component of the structure is attached to the base, another component is attached to the top and same is true here wherein we have the neoprene pad or rubber pad on top of it we also have an helical spring. So, depending on the payload we can if the payloads are more we can have a bigger helical spring. If the payloads are less even sometimes the pads are good enough to take the payload okay. and as I was telling you in the previous diagram some of these pads they have what is known as they are not a thick rubber sheet instead there are pockets so what happens when there is a load because of this pocket if you look at the sectional view so i'm just drawing say two pockets they will flex in so because of a load they will try to move in Okay. and then try to take the load and then try to because we have to arrest motion. So, they will flex and take the motion and then less will be transmitted. So, such are the neoprene pads which are used as used as isolators. Now, such vibration isolators are sometimes used to in engineering to isolate shock. Now, what is shock? For example, you know you would have studied about the vibration wherein in the time domain I have a series of if I can break them into in time domain there will be lot of frequency components of such a time history of the vibration signal. But a shock on the other hand is a large motion occurring for a fraction of a time. Okay. 
and this amplitude could be very very high for example uh, impact like a okay like a gun burst large impact they happen only one in a given uh, period of time they are not repeated we never have repeated shocks for example a large earthquake initial wave is a shock so such shocks have very very large amplitudes so immediately what happens the how do we isolate this suppose if a subject my equipment to such shocks they are going to get damaged because of this high oscillations so in such a case what if you look at the energy point of view in shock isolators if you look at the time i will if the energy is like this to begin with okay in shock isolation we try to reduce because and this energy if there is no isolators this energy would straight go into your component and damage the component so in shock isolation what we do through this isolator try to take in all that energy and it is the same energy but dissipate it at a less lower amplitude with a longer time so the energy you know, the area of this two curve should be the same so energy dissipation at a slower rate okay so if i have a very fast moving object shocks are coming here so this isolators or shock isolators actually try to take this energy and then the same energy goes into the system but at a reduced amplitude because i cannot i cannot eat up energy energy has to anyway go in but i will give it at a much slower rate so this is how because how does that happen this happens by having provisions for this isolators to flex to move unless they move they cannot take up that energy instead if it was a rigid connection everybody everything would go in so this is a soft connection here this is a soft connection here okay so they will have uh, low motions and sometimes this cable mounts are also used in shock isolation system we just saw the example of the missile launcher so such foundations are also put with cable mounts which also act as shock isolators okay in of course you know this is a, not a class in um, vibration because you know engineering shock and isolation or vibration and isolation is a course by itself and i'm sure the teacher must be covering all this there but this is a course on condition monitoring and the, the reason behind telling this is you know once you go to the machines to do cbm you will invariably come across these elements and we have to do measurements ab around these elements because these are the elements wherein the energies go in and go out okay because of an unbalance i will see the forces coming at the uh, at the bearings because of a forging hammer i will see energy coming into the system at the isolators okay so this is another example which i will uh, this on on a back hole loader okay okay in a typically a back hole loader or a truck essentially there are two strong components one is this engine and the chassis and if you observe and this is the unit where the operator or the driver sits and this is a cabin okay and uh, invariably in you know, this construction equipment be it a bulldozer be it a loader they are always subjected to harsh vibrations because of the terrain because of the work nature because they have to shovel etc so these poor operators are really subjected to very harsh levels of both vibration and noise so these cabins you know they may look very robust but they have to they have 
actually supported on four mounts and again our vibration isolator come into play there and one has to decide on good amount of vibration isolators. This is one example we are talking about say a truck. You all must have seen a truck going on the highway, but the cabin where the driver sits actually sits on the chassis and this cabin is actually mounted on the cross frames or the cross frames and the longitudinal rails at four mount locations. So, no matter what comes through the road because of the potholes, because of high speeds, because of undulations on the road, all these motions would normally come into the driver or to the driver's seat. Imagine, I will just give you a story here. See, the, the driver gets excited by a forcing frequency and uh, if you think of a human body as a mechanical system, the internal organs are supported in a fluid and then they oscillate. So, these internal organs also have a natural frequency and this natural frequency is about 2 to 5 hertz, very low frequency. But imagine from the road, if I have a forcing frequency of 2 to 5 hertz coming into the seat on which the driver is sitting, then what is going to happen? The driver is also going to have a resonance at 2 to 5 hertz. The driver will have a nauseating feeling and maybe he will fall sick will throw up and I am sure all of you must have experienced this while going in those you know state transport buses, wherein the there is not good amount of isolation with the seat and the bus floor, they are almost rigidly bolted you would, have, you would have noticed and then you would be saying people feel uneasy going long distances in such buses. On top of it if you think of the luxury buses nowadays, when there are good amount of cushions in the seat, good amount of isolations, they reduce this energy coming in from the road and affecting the passenger or the driver. So, I will just show you one example here in this backhoe loader here. This is a particular case wherein if you can see this, this is actually this yellow one is the chassis of the cab okay, and uh, or the backhoe loader and this is the cabin and this is the isolator. It is nothing but a thick rubber pad. And here we are actually trying to measure the motion, these are the accelerometers which are used to measure the motion of the chassis, this is in a particular direction, this is the transfer, this is the longitudinal and this is the vertical direction. And there is another uh, accelerometer here to measure the response at the mount location on the cab side. So, the effectiveness of this isolator or the vibration transmissibility can be checked by seeing the ratio of these or the difference between these two levels and this difference is large then this isolator is doing a good job. So, this is how the isolators are actually evaluated and uh, then we can also design as to what kind of isolators is to be taken in. And if you look at the forced transmissibility curve. Suppose I have a body which generates a force F and there are certain stiffener, damping etcetera and this is the transmitted force F T. Okay. If you calculate this force transmitted to the applied force, this applied force or the force which is originating because of the dynamics of the machine is given by And if I was to plot this curve, where r is equal to omega by omega n, omega n is equal to k by m and omega is the forcing frequency. Okay. So, this is 1.0, say this is f t by f and this has a plot And this value is root 2, okay, no matter whatever is the damping. So, at a frequency of 
omega by omega nor omega is equal to omega n by root 2 or more. So, that means, if the frequency of driving frequency is more than the root to the natural frequency, the force transmitted will be less than the applied force f. So, the f t by f will be less than 1 for r greater than root 2. And this is a very, very fundamental design equation which all vibration designers work with. And so, we can decide on of course, you know this because somebody asks you estimate me the values of k and c to be used in this machine where this machine operates at say 1200 rpm. So, 1200 rpm means you know 1200 by 60 is the forcing frequency. I know the mass of the um, body I know I have to find out stiffness in c depending on this equation. Okay. And sometimes I can go to the manufacturer's catalog find out for different payloads what is the available stiffness or available damping and then select the isolators. Okay. So, uh, to summarize in uh, vibration applications to engineering, uh, the cases of unbalance, the cases of uh, base excitation, the cases of force transmissibility are very, very important tuned dynamic absorber and damping tuned dampers. And uh, vibrations occur around us everywhere and these techniques which I told you are actually used to reduce the vibration levels, but sometimes we use them or we use them as an indirect means to estimate the condition of the machine because if there is an unbalance, this will give rise to forces in the bearings. If the isolators are not working properly, the vibration levels of the engine will uh, go up. The, if the dampers are not working, the torsional oscillations would be high and the crankshafts would fail. In, in fact, many of the industries you will see the crankshafts failing because the torsional oscillations were high. They were either not arrested by the dampers, you know, particularly in, uh, in uh, ships, these dampers are filled with oil somebody neglected uh, filling up the oil, dampers went dry and the effects happened. Okay. So, we, we have to be careful as to how we can uh, reduce this vibration levels. Uh, in the next class, I will be talking uh, actually in a, I will be giving you more equations and we will try to solve, solve some problems in rotor dynamics, how actually rotor dynamics is an offset from vibrations and how actually rotor dynamics help us understand uh, condition based uh, maintenance. In closing, this is one last slide, wherein you will see the tuned uh, dynamic, uh, sorry, the torsional damper here on this engine. And if you will recall here, in this engine, uh, we had done a lot of unconstrained layer damping to the oil sump to reduce the radiative vibration levels, uh, vibration and noise, noise levels. This is actually in an uh, engine manufacturer's uh, test cell where we are doing uh, some uh, vibration studies on the engine. And particularly, this is the torsional damper because there is a crankshaft here and this is a six cylinder truck engine. So, this oscillations are reduced by having this torsional damper over here. Okay. Thank you.